Okay, so today I am honored to be joined by a friend of mine on this podcast, uh, Pat Flynn. He is not only a friend, but uh, someone who is incredibly smart and incredibly authentic. I, the first time I met him was well over a decade ago, uh, or just over a decade ago, and uh, he immediately struck me as not only someone who cared a lot about what he did, knew a lot about what he did, but actually came from a really good place. Uh, he's always come across as really authentic and um, someone who you can trust uh, to be putting out something that's really valuable, but also with your best interests in mind. He runs a website and a podcast called Smart Passive Income, um, and a number of podcasts, uh, courses online for creators and entrepreneurs, um, what else? YouTube channel. He's written numerous books. Let's see. A couple of his books are Super Fans, The Easy Way to Stand Out, Grow Your Tribe, Build a Successful Business, Will It Fly, um, How to Test Your Next Business Idea So You Don't Waste Your Time and Money. And then he wrote a memoir called Let Go uh, about overcoming adversity through a commitment to pursuing your own path. So he has some incredible things to share about facing resistance and creating in this uh, chaotic world. Uh, and some really uh, like a fun project that he's launched in the last couple of years during the pandemic that he's going to share here as well. So enjoy this podcast. Okay, well, great to have you on, Pat. Welcome. Um, it is such an honor to have you as one of my first guests. Oh, uh, Leo, it is an honor to be a guest on your show. I've been uh, awaiting the day when we would be able to hear your voice on a podcast and, and to be on uh, your show here uh, is truly an honor from this side. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, you know, I've just told people a little bit about you, but to give a little bit more of a personal backstory, I remember when we actually first met in person uh, and it was in Las Vegas in Blog World, like 2011, I think it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, we were with a bunch of people who were, you know, I think they were internet famous or like, you know, the thing that struck me about them was they were all really successful and none of them felt really authentic to me, or at least not none, but I didn't really, I didn't vibe with them, but you stood out to me because you felt like someone who was down to earth and authentic and doing this for the right reasons. Oh, and, thank you. um, <laughs> yeah, so that's why like I, I I resonated with you right away. I appreciate that. I remember that we were I don't know how I got in that room, honestly. Uh, you and you know there, Darren Rouse, who I respected as a blogger, oh, Darren. was okay. was there as well. I wasn't but, trying to talk shit about Darren. So no, no, no. <laughs> Darren's awesome. Like both of you yeah, were great. like a huge inspiration to me when I started blogging in 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 uh, in my journey. But I agree, there were some other people there that I don't think we're going to mention any names for. But it just seemed yeah. like they were there for the wrong reasons or just to serve themselves. And, uh, that's one thing I've always admired about you is, is through your work, especially your writing over the years, you've, you've always come at it from a, a, an approach of serving others, uh, whilst sharing the things that you are learning for yourself too. So I, I appreciate you for that. Yeah. And over the years, I've just watched and watched you like take off and not only that, but, um, put out so much incredible stuff. You've put out courses, you've, uh, you've had different, communities that you've led, books that you put out, uh, blogs and, you know, multiple podcasts, which I just cannot believe, uh, YouTube video uh, channels. Uh, I can't believe how much you churn out. And that was actually one of the things I want to talk to you about. But it's just been amazing to watch your journey as a creator and as a leader of entrepreneurs. Thank you. Um, really amazing. Thanks so much. Okay. So I want to talk, let's see, there's a few things I'm really curious about. Um, but one of them is what I just mentioned is that you put out a lot of stuff. And so I would like to look at you as a creator. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I'm really interested in is that you also, um, help other creators, other entrepreneurs. So you work with a lot of people and you've, you've learned what helps them to get unstuck. And so I'd love to talk about that and then we'll get to this later, but Pokemon is, is the word that I'm going to say. So <laughs> we'll come to that in a little bit because there's something uh, new that you've been putting out that's, that's fascinating. So let's, I'd love to hear more about that. Okay. So the first part is you as a creator. I cannot keep track of how much you've been putting out over the years of the last, you know, 12 years since I've known you. Um, what is your secret? I'm just going to put that as a real simple question. 
<laughs> I mean, they, they, there really is no secret or magic formula. I just create about and around the things that I personally am curious about and enjoy. Um, even when we eventually start talking about Pokemon, you'll see this to be a, a real life, uh, more recent example of that. But Great. even back in 2008, I started out not by teaching other entrepreneurs, but actually by helping other architects. I'd gotten laid off from mm. my architecture job. And to essentially survive uh, that time, I had a website to help architects pass an exam. And that's what oh, I was doing at the time. That's what I learned about. And that's what I felt like I could best help people with. And the cool thing I learned right away was that I could help people even though I wasn't an quote unquote expert on something. If I was just a few steps ahead of where perhaps they were, then I could be greatly useful and I could serve that person. And where this became very apparent was actually just a few months after starting my website and I started selling a PDF file of study notes and worksheets and mm. templates and other things to help people pass this particular exam. The exam was called the lead exam. It's still an exam that exists today. And that website, Green Exam Academy, still exists today, although it's 100% oh, cool. hands off at this point, which is really amazing. Um, but I learned after a few months when my guide came out, uh, the United States Green Building Council, this is the company and the organization that literally writes the questions for this exam, they came out with their own guide. They didn't have one before, which is why I think mine did so well in the beginning, but then they came mm. out with their own. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm done. Like, there's no way I'm gonna survive <laughs> this because why would people buy from me? I'm I'm just a regular person. Uh, why would they buy from me when they could get it from the other people who actually wrote the questions? But little did I know that this would actually boost my sales. People started looking around oh, wow. at other solutions and they found me and they said, oh, this guy, Pat, he just took the exam. He he knows firsthand. He was on the front lines of mm. this exam, which was a very difficult exam, by the way, and very expensive. So a lot of people were spending money to try to pass it and, and many times failing. But uh, they found me. They found my story. I was just like them. And as a result of that, they trusted me. And, of course, with the stories of people who have gotten my guide and then passed and, and me sharing that, they were like, oh, this is, this is my guy. Um, and what was really interesting was when people found that, website and then took part of uh, in my exams and stuff uh, or practice exams and, and uh, test material, they then started sharing that with a lot of others. I, mm. I talk about this story about a woman named Jackie in my book, Superfans, and it, it, she was just a woman who passed the exam with my help. And little did I know that she was going to essentially be like my number one spokesperson for the brand uh, in, in around her area. I noticed one day that 25 emails came in that were from the same architecture firm that she was at. She was able to convince that oh, one wow. person, Jackie, convinced every single person in her firm to buy my guide. And, and she could wow. have just shared hers, but she wanted to help me. And that was like my first experience with a super fan. And I'm like, well, I'm not an artist or a musician or, or an actor yet. I'm still able to help people feel a certain way and have them want to mm. pay me back in return in different kinds of ways. Um, and so to go back to the original thought, like I was just writing about things I knew about and mm. uh, knowing that I could still help people even though I wasn't an expert. And so after that website took off, that's when smartpassiveincome.com was started. And I was just, again, writing about what I knew. Here was this architecture thing I started. Here's how I did it. Uh, here's what I wish I knew. Here's what I would have done differently. Um, and then the other thing that really took off as far as smart passive income was concerned, and you might remember this, I had my income reports published every single month. Oh, that's right. So every month I shared not only what I was doing in the business and how it was rolling, but exactly down to the penny, how much money I was making and where it was coming from, and also how much money I was spending and where it was going. So the expenses and the income, and people started to see over time that these income reports continued to grow and grow. And it, was, it wasn't that long ago, uh, or it wasn't that long after that, that um, creators like Yaro Starak from, uh, mm. uh, gosh, I can't even remember his name of his website. It was just like entrepreneurblog.com or something like that. Um, Darren Rouse reached out to me and wanted to collect that story of how I did that. And so I think, so cool. again, just sharing the story and coming at it from an approach of here's what I learned and here's what I would do if I was in the situation again differently. People really enjoy that sort of just transparency and, and authentic take versus, hey, look at me and I'm successful. Like everybody should do it this way. And this is like the only right. way to do it. I was just like, no, I, there's many ways probably, but this is how I did it. 
and that's that's how I approach content, just the stuff I know. That that way I don't even have to do a ton of research cuz it's yeah. stuff I'm living. So that's that's it. I love that. Let's let's get into when you sit down to create something. So whether it's a course or a podcast or a book um or a YouTube channel, uh mm -hmm. do you face, you know, I would imagine at this point you're superhuman, so you don't have any fears, no resistance. But I'm just wondering, like, yeah, yeah, do you face resistance and fears? And like, wh what do you do to to actually be able to still put that out and, and create? All the time. In fact, if I'm not facing a little bit of resistance or fear, that's when I worry the most. That mm. to me means I'm not pushing myself beyond my comfort zone, which is where all the growth happens. And in the beginning, I didn't know that. In the beginning, I was facing fear and trying to run away from it. I remember... I was asked to speak on stage for the first time in 2011 at the Financial Blogger Conference, which was happening in Chicago. And I wanted to immediately say no. I wanted to, mm -hmm. to run away from that. But I knew it was a good opportunity. So I said yes. And then three weeks before the event happened, uh, Philip Taylor, the founder, said their keynote speaker for the event, their closing keynote speaker, was going to uh, not make it. And he asked me to take his place. And me, not ever having been on stage before, uh, again, I freaked out and I, I initially said, no, I don't want to do this. But I went back again, knowing that there was probably a lot more upside than downside. So that was another thing. It was like, okay, what, what, what ifs could come from this? And typically the what ifs in my brain start to go into the negative realm. Like, what if mm. this ruins my career? What if I uh, embarrass myself? What if I fail? All those kinds of things. But I always try to counter that, but uh, with the other what ifs. What if this actually launches my speaking career? What if mm. I actually learn how to become a better communicator in the process? What if this allows me to introduce myself to people who I wouldn't have gotten in front of uh, otherwise? And so, you know, weighing those pros and cons and thinking realistically about this, you and I have talked about this on my podcast, just like, well, in reality, what's the worst that can happen? Usually it's mm. not as bad as we often make it out to be. Um, but to the point that I mentioned earlier, I've learned over time that all the most amazing growth that has happened in my business and in my life has happened with a lot of nervousness, a lot of apprehension, a lot of tension. And now I look toward those things. I try to make sure that every new thing that I take, every new project, every new book, every new whatever it might be, um, like I have to be nervous or else it's probably not testing myself enough or expanding my mm. boundaries. It's not gonna be um, interesting enough or curious enough for me to figure out. Because if it was comfortable, then I probably already know how to do it and it's not going to test me and it's probably gonna be received in the same way too. Oh, this is kind of the usual stuff that I've seen elsewhere versus Right. Wow, where did this come from? I can feel the, uh, not just the excitement, but how hard perhaps this was. And now Pat's sharing the results because that's what he does. He just shares what he's doing in his life. So yeah, I, I look toward the fear now. I look for it and that's I've amazing. learned that um, it's not gonna kill me, right? It's mm. not gonna kill me. And even if I fail, it will have been a massive lesson that I could take with me forward if I wanna try that thing again or try something similar in the future. It sounds like these are is a hard one lesson, hard one lesson that you've gotten over a number of failures or number of times where you've had to like face that and actually came through it and like didn't kill me and actually this is something that I want, um, which is really amazing to hear. Is there anything uh, tactically that you might do? Like let's say you get up in the morning and you're like, I'm going to write a book right now, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm facing some resistance. Uh, anything that you do to actually be writing um, in the face of that resistance? Yeah, there's two things. Number one, um, this is less tactful, but more mindset. I think about who this is ultimately for. Mm. And so an analogy I love to use is like, if I'm going to be writing something or creating something, I know it's because I want to help people in some way. And I imagine that thing as if it were a life ring, right? And I'm on this boat or raft and I'm like safely on that thing. But I have this life uh, ring that I could throw out to somebody who might be drowning in yeah. the metaphorical, whatever it might be that I'm trying to help them through. Um, am I going to let my fear get in the way of me throwing that life ring out to them? Right. Or that, that worry. Am I going to tell that person who's drowning, I would throw it, but I'm scared. I've never done this before. No, right. I would obviously, if somebody was drowning, I would do whatever I can, even if it wasn't perfect. And if I miss, I reel it back in and I throw it in again until it finally hits them. And then they can, I can pull them back in and, and rescue them. Um, typically I think about that metaphor and I go, wow, what a selfish thing to, to feel that like 
maybe people might be too afraid of my voice, which was the thing that I was telling myself before I started my podcast in 2010. Oh, wow. Or, oh, uh, like people might not enjoy uh, this or, you know, it's probably going to bore them to death or something. It's like, but what if there was that one person who actually, you know, gets inspired by this? Like for them, I have to do it. So that's number one. And number two, uh, oftentimes what drives a lot of the apprehension or just the worry is just the the grandness, the, 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 how big the thing might feel, right? A book is a huge undertaking. I remember when I first wrote my first book, which was, uh, well, my first book was Let Go, which was more of a memoir. So that was very simple because it was more of just my me talking about what had happened in my life. But my first sort of business book was called Will It Fly? And it was published in 2015. And I really struggled to write that thing because it was mm. just so big. It was so much weight to this. And I could churn out a 2,000 to 3,000 word blog post in a couple hours, easy. But mm -hmm. I couldn't even get a paragraph out in five hours of writing because the book just felt so heavy. So what I ended up doing was breaking up this big giant project, this book, into a bunch of little tiny projects, thinking of each chapter as if it were a blog post that I was writing. And within each of those blog posts, thinking about each little section as if it was a section of a blog that I was writing. And what really helped me map that out was my secret weapon, the post-it note. I use post-it notes all the time because I've learned that, you know, I have a creative brain and I think about a lot of things, but they don't often, they're not often thought about in the right chronological order sure. or with any hierarchy. It's messy. My brain is messy. And I think a lot of us can relate to this. So I use post-it notes to take what is in my brain and what is happening and, and, and lay it all out so I can visually see the mess that had just come from my own self. And then I can organize. I call it the dump, uh, lump, and jump strategy. The dump, dump lump, lump, and, and, and jump. And right, jump. so okay. part one is dump. You just dump it all out there. It's messy. It's just it's one big pile of ideas. So if you're writing a book, for example, you need to know ultimately what the purpose is of the book, but there's there might be a million things in between where they're at now, starting with the book uh, as, as a reader to where you want them to go. Hard to know what order to put it, put things in uh, or what to work on. So let's just get it all out there. And even just doing that exercise alone, you can start to already see some things and you can, you mm. can then um, start to lump things together, right? Oh, here are all the things that relate to mindset. Here are all the things that relate to tools. Here are all the things that relate to this. And you can start to actually see that there are clusters now of those ideas that all relate to each other. Those can become the modules of your course or the section of the book that you're writing right. or whatever it might be. And then there you jump things around and reorder them. So, okay, hmm. this should go first. This should go next. This should go next. And the beauty of using a post-it note is I can pick them up and move them around and I can, you know, uh, remove them overall. If maybe I doubled up on something or if there's a missing something, I can easily add something back in versus working on something like a notepad or even something more digital. Although there are digital versions of note, uh, uh, sure. sticky notes. Uh, sure. that one could use. But the beauty of this is after you finish doing that, the dump, uh, lump, and jump strategy, you have your outline for your book. You have your outline for your course. It is there. And now when you're working on it, this big thing, you can just take the one post-it note for that first lesson in that first module, put it on your computer or at your desk, and that's what you need to focus just on right focus now. That's the that. only thing that matters right now, right? And over time- that. They just start to stack and, oh my gosh, by the end of this, you have this thing. Now, of course, with something like a book, you still need to kind of connect and, and put a thread line through all of it. But, um, you know, that, that can come in the second or third draft, which is usually what happens. So that's how I take something that's much bigger, that's very scary. I turn it into a lot of smaller things that are achievable. And um, I like to gamify it. Maybe I can get 10 post-its done this week. And oh, that's I, great. You know, that, you know, that kind of thing, that uh, is something that's motivating to me. Um, and then just seeing how much closer I am to the end goal, like the post-it notes that I finish, I don't just throw away. I put in like the finish pile where I can see it. So every day I'm going in, I'm going, wow, look at how much I've already accomplished. Mm. And then my sunk cost sort of uh, mechanism can go in and go, wow, look how much I already put in this. I need to finish this or else yeah. it'll be a total waste. That's great. Some really great uh, strategies, tactics there from the, you know, life uh, life, what do you call that? Um, life raft kind of thing. I forgot the thing oh, yeah, you yeah. throw out. Um, that one, uh, I love that. And then, you know, just the breaking things down into smaller pieces and the, um, what was it? Dump, lump and jump strategy yes. with the post-it notes. Um, you need to, all, all great. You need to take a good dump. 
to, to, to start. <laughs> uh, you always feel better after you do that. And yeah. gamifying it is another great one as well, like just finding ways to gamify it. Um, do you use any kind of accountability when you're writing or, or creating something like this, either to your team or listeners or readers or anyone else? That's a great question. In many cases, especially when it comes to the online courses or stuff we do for the community, the community itself and my team who is waiting for me to create something is enough for me to be held accountable because I don't okay. want to let other people down. But um, in more personal things or things like books, the books aren't necessarily related to to uh, my team and employees that I have. It's, it's more separate. Um, I have mastermind groups. So I have a couple that mm. I've been in for literally over a decade each now, each with about oh, wow. four or five people. And a lot of times they are checking up on me as if they're just, you know, my account accountability buddies. I mean, that's really what they're there for, in addition to being brutally honest with me when I need to hear it uh, as well. And what's amazing about these groups is, is these are people who, who know me sometimes better than I know myself. They can call mm. me out on things when I might be too blind to them. And, and oftentimes we, you can't read the label when you're inside the bottle. So I have these people that's out right. there who can see the label for me. And it's not just uh, me uh, taking from them all the time. It's actually me being that for them as well. And that's the beauty mm. of, of this sort of like Knights of the Round Table kind of situation, you know, the mastermind or the brain trust, as you sometimes hear it uh, fr from years past, um, FDR's brain, brain trust, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the importance being like relationships are key. We cannot do this alone. And you need other people on the outside to kind of, help you through times that you might need some encouragement, number one, or show you that maybe you're going down the wrong path. And that has been very much uh, probably the, the most va valuable thing for me as far as my other friends and, and colleagues uh, in our mastermind is, um, you know, as I've gotten successful over the years, you know, I've seen it happen with a lot of other people who've become successful who no longer are themselves anymore. They let the fame or the money get to them. Um, they might think that they're too uh that like they're the best and nobody can come up to their level and, and and these kinds of you know negative things that come with success uh i have i have uh given permission to my mastermind group to call me out when they see me going down mm. that same path and and i've gone through not terribly but there have been cases where i've maybe gotten a little big headed as a result of some of the success and they are quick to bring me back to where I need to go. That and my Call wife is very my wife's very quick to bring me back to. She once said that if my head gets too big, she's not going to be there to hold it for me. So <laughs> um, and I'm grateful for that, you know, honestly. That's and, great. And I, I'm at a point now where I can, you know, I'm like unplugged from the matrix of of business success and I can see things and I, I can catch myself before it even becomes a problem at this point. Um, and, and I see it for others too. And I, I try to offer value and help, uh, as a mentor and leader for them in the same regard. That's, am that's amazing. I love that you have her. I love that you have the mastermind groups that are, they know you so well. Um, and if you ever see me getting too big, um, you know, my head too big, just go ahead and call me <laughs> out on it as well. <laughs> Leo, little, uh, uh, real talk here. Um, Thank you for sharing all of that. And I, I, I do talk about that as well, of how important it is to have some kind of support outside of yourself. It's hard mm -hmm. to do this on your own. Um, right. And it's so great to hear um, how you use that. Um, let's switch to how are you working with other entrepreneurs and creators, people who are putting stuff out there. There's a couple of key places that I'm, I'm, I want to ask, get curious about. Um, the first one is just starting out. So like, I want to do something. I don't know exactly what it is. I've got 10 ideas. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know this place? At uh, a lot of my students are in the same exact uh, seat for sure. It's either they have zero ideas or 100 ideas and they don't know where to begin. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and this is exactly why I wrote my book, Will It Fly? It's to help filter those ideas. And the tagline of the book is... Um, you know, how to find your next business idea so you don't waste your time and money or how, how to validate it, right? And that's mm. that's the key word there, validate it. Let's get some validation that this is the path we do want to put our time and effort into before we actually dedicate that time and effort. And there's a few exercises that one could do, if you don't mind me sharing. Um, please, please do. Could be really helpful. Um, you know, one thing I love to do is to uh, talk about my favorite movie, Back to the Future, um, my all time favorite movie. And, and, and my favorite part about it is of course the really cool DeLorean that is the time machine. 
And so I run this experiment, this thought experiment with a lot of people who aren't quite sure which direction to go down, especially let's say you have two ideas. They are both, you know, very curious uh, for you and, and, and per perhaps opportunistic and you're not quite sure which one to try or go down. And so I say, okay, let's just pick one hypothetically. And let's say that that's what you choose. And let's go into our DeLorean one year into the future. And let's just imagine that everything worked out the way you wanted it to, right? Like, don't worry about how that happened. Just you're there a year from now and it worked. Like your idea worked and it's doing what you want to do. What are you doing? What's your day mm. like? Who are you with? Are you happy? And a lot of times we go through this experiments, like a person goes, wow, like I'm seeing myself there, but I'm like, I don't really want to be doing that all the time. Hmm. And it's interesting because we come back to today, we, we take the DeLorean back to now and they go, wow, like that wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Like, it sounds attractive now, like the money is cool, but like, that's not something that I would get excited about waking up every day to. So even though it would have been successful, I still don't want to do that. And how amazing it is to know now that that might be the case so that you don't even have to even go down that path. That's right? great. Um, other times it's the opposite effect and, and many times it is as well as you go there and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is what I'm doing and I don't have to do this anymore. And I want that. This is, and that future state provides motivation for the current state and That's allows right. for like, almost like a, wow, you saw yourself there. Like that is possible. So don't mm -hmm. let that fear and don't let the, the, the anxiety sort of like stop you from potentially getting there. Like you want that you go get it. And now you saw yourself there. So that experiment is sort of like number one, uh, because it's even before any of the tactics or strategies come into play, you can decide whether or not this is actually a path you'd want to go down or not. And then if it is a yes, then you can move on to some of the more business specific things where I often recommend if you have an idea, find uh, th this is my um, what I like to call the one strategy. And this is finding one person who is in that target market. Again, you have your idea and you're gonna find one person. It might be in a community, it might be a friend of yours, or you go out there, again, you don't need a website or nothing. You just need to find one person. That exercise alone is gonna teach you where these people exist and how to talk mm. to them and where they're at. So that's like really helpful, number one. That's great. And then you go and help that person. You try to figure out a way to get them to agree to work with you for X number of weeks or days or whatever, for you to be able to help them to get to that goal or to solve that problem or get rid of that inconvenience, whatever it might be. And again, that alone provides a lot of exercise and experimentation and, and, and real life experience to, well, how do I even convince somebody to do that? What might I say yeah. to them? How, how do I even get their attention? To do this with just one person brings it down to something that is manageable and something that is much easier than thinking, okay, I need a thousand people on an email list. What is an email list? How do we even get people on there? I need a website. Well, how do I even make a website? Like all these it can get overwhelming, yeah. right? Versus let's just find somebody. No website needed. Just a direct connection to them through a direct message platform or or, or email. I love the simplicity of that. Or text. Yes, exactly. And then here's the beauty of it. Part three of number one is you help that person get a result. You have a testimonial now that you could use when you are now promoting this or creating your website or whatever. But more than that, and this was very important for the entrepreneur, is you now have the confidence that what it is that you're trying to do actually freaking works. Because that is the number one thing that often stops people. You might have the most beautiful website and pitch and product, but if you aren't sure, which most entrepreneurs aren't, you're not sure that this is gonna work or it's worth a person's money or you just are hoping that this might take off, it's gonna be very difficult for you to relay that message that this is the right thing for them. Because if you are a little bit you know, timid about the way that you talk about your product or whatever it is that you're offering, then how can you expect somebody to receive it in a very confident manner? Versus you know that you have the metaphorical cure to this disease. If you had a cure mm. for a disease, you would do nothing but really go aggressive with promoting this and not aggressive in a bad way, but just do what it takes to make sure that the people who this, um, who have this, again, metaphorical disease, you have the cure for. And guess what? There is somebody that you've already quote unquote cured or helped or solved this mm. problem for. Now it's not even a question. It's, I need more people like the person I just helped. And often where there's one, there's many more in that same community. And of course that person can then probably share it with somebody else who's going through the same thing because many people connect with each other who, who have similar problems. Um, so this is the method that I would recommend to start out with that's very low friction, but it is high, um, 
it feels higher pressure because you ha sure. actually have to talk to somebody, right? Part of the yeah. benefit of when we started our businesses back in the day was, ooh, I can kind of just hide behind a keyboard and I don't even have to talk to anybody. Right, yeah. exactly. But today you have to do that because everybody is behind a keyboard. And right. in order to stand out, a little bit of interaction goes a very long way. And then you can that take what sense. you've learned and, and amplify that into now a beta group with 10, 20 people going through now a proven course, or maybe you make sure you write down the process that you taught Jimmy in the beginning, and now you can turn that into a digital course or a book or what, what have you, so that you can scale that up and, and help more people at once. So that's how I'd recommend a person sort of get started in the beginning. I, I love it. That's a really smart method. And I, you know, I could see the S and SPI, uh, really, smart, really smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you for sharing that. Uh, if someone, what if someone is in the, like, I have two or three things that I really want and I like can't choose between them. I just like kind of stuck there and frozen. Yeah. I mean, if you're stuck and frozen, then those ideas are just going to remain ideas and nothing will happen, right? You have to pick one. And a lot of people in this stage go, well, let me try all three, right? Cause I'm going to, I'm going to try all three. And then, you know, one of them has to stick. The truth is if you divide your energy across two to three projects, then each of those projects will have half or a third of what you could potentially offer and thus not really have a chance to take off. And so right. I would say start with one, the one that you're most excited about or the one that uh, and or the one that perhaps you have the easiest opportunity to begin to find that one person or create the thing that you're creating um, and then give yourself six months or a year to fully focus on that. You know, you don't have to commit to it forever, but giving yourself a good amount of time to focus on it, to put your energy into, to give it an actual chance, then you can make an assessment in that time period. I remember Darren Rouse talking about when he started his blog, problogger.net, it was his wife who gave him the ultimatum. You have six months to make this work as oh, a business. Uh or else this is not going to be what you're doing, right? <laughs> uh, and, and he created, I think this was before ProBlogger, it was digitalphotographyschool.com. Oh, I remember that, that, that yeah. he started. Um, and it was that, okay, six months, I got to make this work. This is the one thing I'm going to focus on and I got to get it to start making money. And, and he did, and he's done really well with it. I don't know if he still owns it or sold it, but uh, that thing still continues to run today. Yeah. So I, that, that's how I would start. And, and, and in some cases, honestly, with some of my students who, who are confused on which one to do, just flip a coin. Like you got to make some progress somewhere. Every day you wait to either put content out there or try to reach out and help somebody is a day that is wasted. That uh, is an opportunity for learning and uh, an opportunity to get to the next step uh, on that's that great. staircase. So, um, you know, the, the, the other part about this that's often scary is, and, and, part of the underlying reason why people freeze is because um, they want things to be perfect. They are waiting for the planets to align uh, before yeah. making a decision. It's like, they're, they're not going to like, it is going to be up to you. Everything to has make to be it happen. perfect. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember my wife and I, we were like, Oh, like, we don't know if we want to have kids. Cause it's, you know, there's always something going on. That's that might get in the way of that. Or, you know, buying exactly. a house, there was always, Oh, well, what if, the market goes down more or I don't know if we're quite ready. Like there's never a perfect time, but yeah. we knew ultimately what we wanted. So we went for it and now we have a house, two kids, everything's great. Same thing with business. I did, I didn't wait for perfect time because the perfect time is actually yesterday to start. Mm. Um, so yeah. So great. So great. Um, yeah, I wish I wish I had some of those objections to having kids. I had I ended up having six of them, so yeah, <laughs> I didn't have enough objections. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I'm kidding. I love all of them. The um, w I want to get to Pokemon. Speaking of kids, uh, but before we get there, um, one last place that people find themselves that I wanted to to ask about. Maybe it's a couple of places, but it's I've created the book. I've created the course. I've made the thing but here in private mm -hmm. and now it's time to put it out there and i'm feeling a lot of resistance to putting myself out there or marketing myself because it feels inauthentic um, or i'm worried about putting it out there and just crickets um yeah. so uh, anything that you you say to the people you work with who are in that place um, crickets <laughs> yeah number Great. number one sorry i have my soundboard here so um <laughs> Number one, I always recommend that you share what it is that you're creating whilst it's being created mm. or while it is being created. 
Um, this way you can let people in on a lot of behind the scenes of what it is that you're doing. A lot of people are interested in things that are happening as they're happening, right? Um, That's great. This, this is why uh, how it's made on the Discovery Your Science channel has been you know, around for so long because we just love to see how the rubber tire gets made. We don't even care about rubber tires, but we love to see <laughs> the, the, the factory and how it's made. So people become very curious, but of course, if they are – uh, fans of yours, or even if they're not, and they get curious about what you're doing, they can become fans of yours. And mm. so by the time the thing comes out, your book comes out, they'll already have invested time leading up to that and probably want to support you. Uh, and, and they almost feel like they're a part of it. And in fact, one thing that you could do to take that one step further as a creator is to get your audience involved in some way, shape or form to get them to feel like they were actually a part of it in some way, whether it's as simple as a survey that you can then include inside of your book or even having them choose what the cover might look like. That's something that I've done with each of my books and it's been very good for um, getting people involved and feeling like they've, they've had some say in, in where things end up. Um, the other part about this, and I'm reminded of a author, his name's Andy Weir. He wrote the mm -hmm. book, The Martian. And mm -hmm. when he wrote that book, he wrote it publicly on a blog and was chapter by chapter just kind of sharing it as he was going along. And what was really cool was that a lot of people started to share it because they really loved the story. But then it got to the point where even NASA engineers were following along because of obviously there was a lot of science in it. And they were able to provide help and calculations for oh, Andy so that – eventually ended up in the book. So by the time the book came out, we knew it was gonna be a bestseller because everybody had been following it already. And you might think, oh, well, that's like sharing the work before you even like, you know, pu publish it. Like, isn't that bad? But the truth is you have a lot more to gain from the fans and the people who are there along the journey. This They call it work in public. And mm. that goes a very long way today versus let me create this thing in secret then try to shout from a megaphone and hopefully <laughs> capture people's attention who don't know me yet, who don't even know what this is. I have to interrupt their day to tell them that I have this thing. How like selfish does that feel mm. versus let me take you in on what I'm doing and here's what's going well, here's what's not going well. And if you have something to add or support me with, awesome. And by the time it comes out, a person may have already ch checked out the whole story or learned all the information but they're going to want to pay you and also share it because they're a part of the journey with you. And when they're involved, they're invested, right? When That's they're so involved, great. they will get invested. Now, let's say you didn't do that and you have, um, you know, this book or this course or whatever. Now, there are ways to get in front of people still uh, through sure. advertising or running workshops and trainings. I think the number one way to go about advertising or sharing something that you have in front of new people is to have – a collaboration, somebody else who already has an audience hmm. trusting in you to come to their audience and sharing this information. So similar to what we're doing right now, you are so generous to have me on your show. And now everybody's introduced to my, <coughs> excuse me, my work and what I'm doing. And uh, should they enjoy what they hear or watch and, and see, uh, they might go deeper and, you know, subscribe to my newsletter or buy one of my courses or something down the road. Right. Uh, e even if you didn't know me before, because of your connection, the listeners collection to, uh, connection to Leo here, like I'm here with your trust and that speaks very highly. Absolutely. Right. And that, 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 that fast forwards the relationship building between me and, and one of your mm. listeners super fast. And that's thanks to you. So again, the importance of relationships and building those relationships and, you know, meeting people in person and, and, and collaborating, uh, helping each other grow is, is really key. You cannot do this alone. And if I'm sorry, like if you've created something all on your own with like in a, in a silo with n no contact to anybody else, it's going to be a big uphill battle to try to get it in front of people. It's not to say it can't happen, uh, especially if it's good, but you can fast forward a lot of your success and reach by building those relationships with your audience along the way and also other creators and, and influencers. That's great. I love how in both of those things, create in public and, and collaborate, you know, if you've already created it, um, there's a lot of like connection and collaboration there. It's not so much like I'm a solo creator, but right. I'm working with others and it just feels a lot more like community or, um, you know, you're building, building some of these connections that are, really enriching. Um, I think Andy Weir is a great example of uh, disproving that idea of like, you've already given it away in public. <laughs> like, yeah. how could you make any money? He's done okay. You know? <laughs> so, he has um, done okay, for sure. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, like I was thinking about this the other day, information is freely available everywhere now, right? right. Um, we are at a buffet 
and there's so much information that people are piling onto their plates, right? The mm. information back when we started was the thing that was valuable because that information didn't exist. So therefore we could either charge for it or we would grow an audience because we were able to share these things that nobody else had before. But now all the information's out there, YouTube, on blogs and podcasts, you could find whatever it is you, that you need. So what's gonna be the difference now? It's the human element that lives on top of that. It's the unique experiences of the creator that then could put on top of that information. That connection to the audience is gonna be what helps you stand out. And so instead of a buffet, I wanna be the creator who, yes, there's a buffet over there, everybody's piling their plates and all, like I think we all feel we're getting bloated with how much we're consuming out there hmm. to keep the analogy going. I wanna be the person who has the restaurant that serves a four or five course meal and creates an experience with that food, mm. right? I don't wanna give you all the food that we have in the kitchen. I wanna give you my masterpiece and I want you to enjoy it and also invite your friends and also wait in line because there's so much demand for it because I'm not <laughs> just giving it to everybody um, because it's not just about the information and the ingredients, it's about the way that I put it together and what it tells you it's 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 i want i want you to be like that food critic in ratatouille who takes a bite of the ratatouille and then goes back to your childhood transported like, yes yeah. that, that's what i want to do for for my audience it's amazing um so beautiful so yeah um and and if people you know i know you have a newsletter uh called getting unstuck uh, is that a good place to get stuff around all of the stuff we've just been talking about? Yeah, uh, the, the newsletter is called Unstuck, so you can oh, unstuck. get there you go. Unstuck uh, at <laughs> smartpassiveincome.com slash unstuck. And what it is, it's a weekly newsletter, about a five minute read, and I share a story of how I or somebody else has gotten unstuck in, in business. And uh, this is something that hopefully provides some inspiration um, in a quick way every week to your inbox. And every email also includes a dad joke because that's very much who I am. <laughs> and so a lot of people Perfect. look forward to that. As well, so subscribe even if it's just for the da the dad jokes. But uh, no, thank you for allowing me to That's share perfect. that. Uh, SmartPassiveIncome.com/slash/unstuck. Okay, and so you've already given us some really incredible things, but I know that you've got so much more in your books. We'll link to all of those, thank and you. I highly recommend subscribing to Unstuck. Uh, before we go, we got to talk about Pokemon. We do have to talk about Pokemon. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is something that I was not aware of before we started recording. So it shows like you've been putting out so much stuff; it's hard to follow everything uh, that everyone's doing. But um, it's it sounds fascinating. So so tell me a little bit more about that project. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect everybody who knew me on SPI or even longtime friends to know that I'm doing this because it's for a completely different audience, and that's the cool thing about it. It's become an amazing case study for being able to start something new today in front of a new audience that didn't know mm. me before and create something amazing. So in 2020, my kids and I started to get into Pokemon because it was pandemic. We were just looking for fun things to do. And then of course they kind of moved on to something else, but I went really deep with it. I got involved <laughs> in YouTube channels. I became a moderator for other YouTube channels in the Pokemon really? space. And then I started to notice, so what's really interesting about the Pokemon collector space specifically, there's many facets to Pokemon. There's the game aspect of it, but the collecting is the, is the part that I really enjoy and love. Um, there's a lot of creators who've been creating for a very long time on YouTube who have been sharing their collections, showing the new cards that they've obtained and sharing information about those cards, the market prices, uh, the... Um, the things that are rare, the things that are common, uh, opening packs on video, even live. Mm. There was a, a friend of mine now, his name is uh, Nick or Pokerev, uh, as he's known. He will have upwards of ten to 12,000 people watching him open Pokemon cards live, live. on his channel. <laughs> That's incredible. It, it is incredible. You know, you might think it's a bunch of kids, and it is a lot of kids, but sure. the majority of the audience are people my age, people who grew up when Pokemon, uh, the anime came out and the card game came out in the 90s, who we would spend our allowance on it, but now those people are grown up and have money to spend and are going to spend mm -hmm. it on stuff that is nostalgic and bringing their kids along and stuff. So anyway... Being in that space for about six months, I was like, you know what? I think I could bring something different to this space and something interesting. So I started a YouTube channel. It's called Deep Pocket Monster. And I started it in January of 2021. In 11 I love months. that title, by the way. Thank That's you. That's great. Yeah. Um, in 11 months and 28 days, it hit 100,000 subscribers. Oh, wow. um, my Pat Flynn Entrepreneurial Channel took 10 years to get to 100,000 subscribers. <laughs> And currently That's today, incredible. after two and a half years, it is n approaching 700,000 subscribers, uh, 200 million views. Some of our videos have been on the top trending page of oh YouTube. God. One of them was number three at one point. And what am I doing? I'm telling story. I'm bringing a lot of what I've learned from the business space as far as um, storytelling 
capturing people's attention, cinematography, and I'm bringing that, which is my unfair advantage, into this space, and it's kind of blowing people away. And so, wow. I, you know, if you'd like, you could check out some of the videos at Deep Pocket I'm Monster. Definitely check it out. Um, what's beautiful is a lot of the comments are like, I don't even like Pokemon and these videos are, are really interesting. So we try to tell a story or I'm trying to complete a challenge within a certain period of time. And we're getting really into the weeds of the analytics and YouTube and how YouTube works and um, the titles, thumbnails, et cetera. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm doing live streams and I have three to 4,000 people watching at a time, which is amazing. Um, the ad revenue coming in from YouTube is actually more money than I'm making in my other business at this point, oh, which wow. is ridiculous. That um, is ridiculous. Not to mention, I'm still doing affiliate marketing. I'm an affiliate for uh, some binder companies and, and other card protector companies and other things. But this really climaxed in June of 2023, where I held an event in Anaheim, California uh, called Card Party. Okay. And 2,500 people came to Anaheim, California from oh all God. around the world to nerd out on Pokemon cards for two and a half days. And uh, by the end of the event, we sold tickets to the next year without even a location or date. And we had sold 300 tickets to the next year's event. So this crowd was very hungry for an event like this that was family friendly, that brought a lot of the creators in from the space, that brought a lot of the big name brands like Ultra Pro and um, Beckett and PSA and CGC, all these grading card companies and all these other vendors came in. And then to see families and kids enjoy and really focusing on their experience, we set a world record. I don't know if you saw this, but. I did not notice event, that. At the event, we set a world record. Guinness world record. We have oh a world my God, record. certified. Certified, That's yes. amazing. We, we, we had a person from Guinness there and I got to give credit to Chris Gillibo who's, who did this at World Domination Summit. I remember. Um, so I was like, okay, we're gonna do the same thing. And so we broke the record of um, most people opening a pack of trading cards simultaneously with 1,189 oh. people. Uh, 1,189. Yeah, and we had wow. an adjudicator there from Guinness uh, who, who made it really fun. And, and now, like this was, it was a very expensive thing to do. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of coordination and a, and a lot of headache, but I really wanted it to happen because this first year for the event, and especially for these people, I wanted them to take home something that they couldn't get anywhere else. So now there's 11,000 or 1,189 people who can say they are now a world record holder and Amazing. have that memory and experience to share. Um, and so next year is looking to be a little bit bigger. And, uh, you know, I've already had some companies come out and say, hey, we want to purchase this event from you and I'm not quite ready to sell oh, it really? but you know we've we've created something special and and I'm a 40 year old guy playing with cardboard with cartoons on it and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm having the time of my life it sounds like so much fun and it's such an incredible story I gotta ask what do you so if this took off so fast compared to your other YouTube channel um, what what do you attribute that to anything that you did or is it just the the niche um it was definitely the care for making every video a gift to the subscriber. Mm. Um, that was something that another YouTuber, Ryan Trahan, said. And it's really focusing on the, the, the package of the video and making it worth a person's time. Because on YouTube, what happens is if you can get people to A, click on the video, and B, stick on the video. So this is the click and stick strategy for YouTube. Um, okay. If you can just get a person to stick around, then YouTube goes, oh my gosh, like people love this video. Let's send it to more people because that keeps people on our platform. If you can help YouTube keep people on the platform, then YouTube is gonna help you by sharing your video with more people on the I platform. See. And so we've been really playing into that and playing into the storytelling and, and the first you know 30 seconds of the video, really making it so clear that there are things in this video that you're not gonna wanna miss uh, or creating open loops or open gaps that then close at the end and really trying to bring emotion into this as well, into something that's like, you know, seemingly emotionless. Uh, we try to put story in there of, of, of a lot of positivity and help and, and uh, community. And uh, it's been really amazing. So that, that's been a big part of it as well. Plus I feel like the general size of the audience for Pokemon, Pokemon is the number one media franchise in the world. It's bigger than LucasArts. Huh. It's bigger than, you know, uh, Disney. Disney. Um, it's, it's I huge. did not know that. Uh, and so the audience size is, is much bigger. 
Um, and even though the CPMs or the cost per thousand, uh, as far as ads is much smaller because it is a general audience, just the reach is much bigger and wider. So, um, we've been able to, to enjoy that as well. So yeah, it's been great. And, and and now I have a collection worth like nearly a half million dollars uh, at the same time. So it's, it's, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. (laughs) I am just rocked by this whole thing. Um, (laughs) this is incredible. I, I, I want to respect your time. So I'd like to close here. But um, I want to say thank you for all of this. Like everything that you shared was just gold. Um, you talked about me being generous, having you on here and sharing you with my audience. I feel like you've been the one who's been generous oh, sharing you. your, your wisdom and just hard won knowledge uh, here with us. So much great stuff. I'm going to link to all of the books, to your, um, to your YouTube channels and podcasts. Um, it's going to be a really long list of links, but uh, but it's all really good stuff. And I just want to say thank you, Pat, thank for you, being on here. I appreciate you. Thank you to the listener for sticking all the way through. I appreciate you as well. And uh, looking forward to connecting again soon, man.